This video is brought to you by Pramp. Pramp is a free online service that allows you to prepare for your upcoming technical interviews. The nice thing about Pramp is that it allows you to practice like you play. The way it works is you sign up for Pramp, which is free, and then you schedule a time that works for you to set up your mock interview. Pramp automatically matches you with a peer at the time that you select, and when the interview starts, you each have 30 minutes to play the role of both the interviewer and interviewee. Prior to the start of the interview, you will be provided a technical interview question from Pramp that you will ask your peer, and your peer will also be given a question that they will ask you during the interview. One of the things I really enjoy about the Pramp service is that it forces you to work under time pressure and also peer pressure, and this is something that you can't quite obtain from just grinding leak code questions or cracking the coding interview problems. So these are great resources, but knowing how to deal with getting stuck in a setting where someone else is watching and assessing you is incredibly valuable and this is something that really pays off to practice. If you want to sign up for Pramp and give this a shot, please check out the sign up link in the description of this video. Using Pramp is 100% free, but using that link helps support my channel. So if you found my content to be helpful and feel as if you could benefit from a Pramp service, then please sign up and give it a try. In this series of videos, we're going to be going over a particular category of interview that you may encounter when doing a software engineering or programming interview, and that is a system design interview. So a lot of the other content on this channel focuses on the really meat and potatoes type of questions that you'll most likely get in such an interview, namely data structures and algorithms. And I can link to both those playlists in the description if you want more information on both of those. System design is a little bit more high level, it's a little bit more vague, and it's a little bit more guided by the interviewer that you have and the problem that you're trying to solve. So a system design interview or a system design by Wikipedia's definition, is the process of defining the architecture, modules, interfaces, and data for a system to satisfy specified requirements. So let's just dive a little bit more deeply on that. One particular example of a system design question that you might get, let's say that you're applying for Facebook, is that you might be asked to design the Messenger application. So that is kind of a loaded question. There's a lot of moving parts there and you can answer that question in a number of ways. And based on how you answer that question, you'll no doubt have to talk about how you scale that up to millions of users, how you, if you archive data at all, lots of other things, and most of those other properties of the design are going to be dependent on what your interviewer actually cares about. So the requirements can vary based on who your client or interview is and what they want you, uh, what they want the product to achieve. And a lot of these questions really focus about scaling and really kind of knowing about different database technologies that typically comes up a lot in these questions as well. So the type of question or the specific system design question that we're going to look at in this video is a URL shortener. So this is the question that's it's quite popular one in terms of system design interviews. And this is the question that we're going to explore. Of course, as I mentioned before, since these questions can be quite vague and open-ended, we're not going to be able to cover every single uh, area of this question. It's going to be only one facet of this question. So depending on who is interviewing you, you could possibly get the same question, but it might go in a completely different direction. Hopefully some of the content that we cover will be broadly applicable to that, but depending on what they're actually looking for, it could go a number of different ways. So let's actually dive into what a URL shortener is just so we're on the same page, and then we'll kind of see what we can do to understand this problem and how to scale it, how to build it at scale. So what is a URL shortener? So I think most of you probably already know what a URL shortener is, but just in case you don't, it's a service that if you have a long URL like this URL right here, so this is the URL for my YouTube channel, it's kind of ugly and long, what you can do as a user is you can send this to some server or a website that exists, and the server will give you back a short link, and the short link points to the initial link that you sent it. So you can share this, you can put this on a business card or a website or whatever you want to do with it. It's just a little bit more concise to look at, to send, and uh, it can you know, serve a number of different purposes depending on why you might want to use a URL shortener, but that's really the gist of what it does. So just to elaborate a little bit more on that example, uh, so this is my YouTube channel that was sent off to that service, and as I mentioned before, it's quite long, and then this is the shortened URL. This is actually a shortened URL that is given to us by Google's URL shortener. There's a number of URL shorteners out there in the market, and this one is a Google solution, which unfortunately is going to, I think, be uh, the support for it is going to stop. So this is dependent on when you watch this video, Google's URL shortener may not be working. So all the links that are going to be created will work, but you may not be able to create any new links with this. So just uh, if you if you do want to look into this a little bit more, just be aware of that. 
So a little bit more on the example. So uh, once we create the URL, then we can share it. So once we create the shortened URL, what we can do is we can provide that to other people. And those people can take that shortened URL, go to their browser of choice, and then that URL goes to the server and the server checks where that URL points to and it says, okay, this is where we're going to redirect you to and it redirects the user in the browser to where the, UR the short URL is pointing to. That's generally the idea of the URL shortener. So pretty straightforward, probably a little bit more explanation that was necessary to describe that, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, there it is. So URL shorteners in the wild, as I mentioned, Google's solution will be eventually decommissioned. There are other ones which are still active and hopefully will be by the time you watch this video, bit.ly, tiny URL, and if you just Google URL shortener, you'll probably find a whole ton of other solutions out there in the wild. So let's continue to take a look at how we can design from high level a URL shortener. And just as a synopsis of what we've already said so far, we can define the shorthand, lural and serial for long URL, short URL. And what we really want is a function which is going to take a long URL and convert it to a short URL. And that short URL should redirect to the long URL. So that's kind of what we're after. It's an abstract idea of how we can view this URL shortener. And if we want to look at it in more of sort of an API way or software engineering way, we want these two functions. So the first prototype that we have here is some function called create short URL, it takes a long URL, it gives us a short one, and then get long URL, takes a short URL, and then gives us the corresponding long URL to which that short URL redirects to. That's kind of what we're after. And one of the constraints that we want to impose on a problem is that if we're given, if we give a URL, a shortened URL with the same let's say digits here at the end. So if we give this URL to someone, we don't want to create another URL with the same digits at the end of that for another website. So this is uniquely pointing to this website here. We don't want to go ahead and then assign the same string of digits to another person's URL to point to a different website because it's going to break some things. So we want to make sure that all of the short URLs are unique. We don't want any overlap between any of the characters there because if we do, if that URL already exists, then you'll have the same short URL pointing to the same long URL and that's going to cause problems. So that's more of what that's saying there. So let's think about what we actually want to store and what we're actually going for here. So let's just consider sort of a data model for some of the simplest objects that we're going for. So for each entry that we're going to store, let's assume that we're going to store all of this into a database. And for the time being, let's just kind of put the type of database and all that aside. We're storing all this information in the database by uh, figuring out what we actually want to store. So the long URL, we want to know where we're going to be directed to, and we also want to store the short URL. So right now I have these two fields. The shortened URL is this one right here. This is the unique short URL that points to the corresponding long URL right here. So that's what we're storing there. We can simplify that a little bit, and we can say, well, really what we're storing here, we're also storing the domain of the URL shortener, which in this case is Google's URL shortener. We don't really need to store that domain because we already know what domain we're going to be using. So for instance, if we're uh, bit.ly or tiny URL or any of those, we already know the domain that we're using to redirect people. So we can already, we, we can already assume that we know that. So we don't need to store that in the database. That's just going to essentially add bloat to our database. We're, we're storing information that we don't necessarily need. So instead of doing that, we can just store the unique set of characters that correspond to the short URL and we can just get away with that. The next thing that we can do is we can also alter the uh, naming a little bit just to kind of be a bit more explicit about what we're actually storing in our database. So we're storing the short URL, which is the string of digits that's unique to the short URL that points to the corresponding long URL. And we're gonna call the long URL the destination just to make things a little bit more explicit. So now let's go ahead and think about how we can go about shortening that URL. So keep in mind that what we want to do is we want to, the whole purpose of our service is to take a long URL and make it short. So we want to make it short, but at the same time, if we make it too short, the number of unique URLs that we can actually generate is going to be quite limited because there's only so many possibilities that you can get away with when you're dealing with a very small character set. So we want to strike a good balance in between that where we don't make it too short where it's just limiting and we don't make it too long where it defeats the purpose and you might as well just have the regular URL. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow the same kind of pattern that the Google URL shortener follows and also the same pattern that bit.ly and tiny URL follow as well. We're going to give a little bit more meaning to what these characters are, how they work, and how we can actually go about generating them. 
So let's look at this domain or this URL again. And this part of the URL, as we mentioned before, is just the domain of the URL shortener. And then this part is the unique string of digits that correspond to the shortened URL. So if we were to continue to generate more shortened URLs, we would run some experiments and find that the elements or the possible sets of characters in this set of six elements here is some element of the following set. So it's either an uppercase letter, A to Z, a lowercase letter, A to Z, or some uh, number zero through nine. So it's one of those characters and there's six specific unique characters in this URL. So if we were to generate a shortened URL that's based on this type of idea, we would have 62 possible characters because if we add up 26 from this character set, 26 from this character set, and then 10 from this character set, we would get 62 possible characters. And if we assume that the string of digits or string of characters at the end of that URL is going to be uh, part of the shortened URL, we would have 62 to the six possible shortened URL combinations that are unique. So that's going to be this number right here, which is a little bit over 56 billion. And we can ask ourselves, is this enough? Is this going to be enough possible unique URLs for our service? Assuming that we put this out into the wild and allow anyone to create a URL, a shortened URL from our service. So there's about 700 million or so websites that are currently active, probably more, but the 56 billion number is far and away quite a bit lo larger than 700 million, so we should be okay. So we shouldn't encounter any issues with a limited number of shortened URLs. And in fact, you, you could probably even get away with reducing that number a little bit, crunching the numbers again, and then seeing if that number makes sense. So a lot of this is going to be guided by your interviewer, whether or not this is, this is going to be an adequate uh, purpose for the task at hand. It might be a subset of the internet where you only need to worry about a smaller set of URLs, possible URLs. So this might be overkill and you might want to bring it back down a little bit. Maybe it's for some other problem that's a bit more contrived or specific. So this is just kind of a, a very general thing that you could probably assume that this is going to be some way in which you can derive estimates for whether or not you have enough potential here for uh, unique URLs. But again, a lot of that's going to be guided by your interviewer. So in this case, the general formula for how many possible unique URLs is going to be given by C to the N, where C is the number of characters, again, that's 62, and N is the number of spots that we allow those characters to occupy. So in this case, we had 62, which is the number of total characters, uppercase, lowercase, and zero through nine. And then we had six possible slots, so that was 62 to the six. So again, as I mentioned before, the trade-off here is that longer URLs are going to defeat the purpose of having a URL shortener, but shorter URLs are going to lead to less possible unique strings. So you need to find a good balance and kind of strike that balance with your interviewer. So this seems like a good point to stop the first part of the video on the URL shortener, and we'll continue in the second part where we'll be considering how to estimate various quantities of this problem, specifically traffic, memory, bandwidth, these sorts of things. And again, a lot of this is going to be contingent on the interviewer asking you this problem, but we're going to try to cover the vast majority of what you might want to estimate to design such a URL shortener. So we'll continue on the next video. If you have any questions, comments, or anything feedback, please don't hesitate to leave that in the comment section below. Any relevant links will be in the description of this video, and that pretty much does it for now. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.